1 Corinthians 9, a familiar passage. I really want to thank you for praying. I don't uh, take that lightly. I believe God's work, as I'm sure you've heard me say before, is done through prayer. I believe OM's greatest victories and greatest defeats are on the same sentence. The victories have been the lessons we've learned in prayer, the times we've persevered in prayer. Perhaps OM's strongest point, and at the same time, the thing that concerns me the most in OM is not the lack of money, but the lack of prayer. People who still are not experiencing personal reality in their own prayer lives and in the prayer fellowship, in the half nights of prayer. And it's easy in OM to take these things for granted. Perhaps I have the privilege that most of my life has lived outside of OM these days. It hasn't always been that way. When I was uh, uh, directing the Lagos ministry years ago and in India, many of my years have been spent very much within the OM uh, community. But now I'm more on the road, out of the community, leading uh, often nights of prayer for other people. Tomorrow I'm all day with YWAM and their whole national conference of all their workers in the whole country. And as some of you know, I've been with uh, Campus Crusade for the last uh, short time, Explo in Berlin, where four and a half thousand were gathered. And I was asked to lead the prayer time, uh, sort of extended prayer time in Birmingham before going over to, Ber to Berlin. And you know, it's, it's amazing people just so appreciate these meetings. In fact, um, in the Birmingham meeting, after sharing these very short sentences on the unreached people, I asked how many had never really been gripped with this before, what the whole thing of world vision and the unreached people is all about. 90% raised their hand that they never had really seen this before. That's about 2,000 people. And I think one of the greatest dangers in OM is we become so accustomed to spiritual things and a night of prayer for some it's a bore, for others they don't bother to go, uh, for others it's of course a chore, not that we expect it always to be easy because we don't. Just imagine in the Soviet Union if they had a privilege for a prayer meeting like this, I will tell you, with the information we have, they would, they, you know, can't believe it. The most appreciative people I think of my ministry in the past weeks was just a few days ago in East Berlin, communist Germany, and going through uh, the famous Checkpoint Charlie, which you see in all these spy films, too many of which I have watched, uh, is quite an experience. Uh, you know, you're just waiting for someone to shoot. But it was all rather dull, actually. Except the meetings and the privilege of meeting these believers who, uh, you know, just are so appreciative of people willing to come from the West. And they, they want to give. Their money isn't worth anything out of East Germany. One dear lady came to me and gave me her watch right off her wrist, and she said, I'd like you to give this to a Christian worker in, uh, in the West. Do you think anybody could, could use it? And I was reluctant, but I said I'd try to get it to someone in India, and I took it. I wondered, you know, going back through the checkpoint, Charlie, they're going to find this woman's watch on my arm and somehow it was <laughs> it was late at night and they weren't even they didn't even have any customs inspection going out of uh, of east um, germany anyway it's good to to be back for this short time and i thank you for praying and i know many of you have prayed and i know that um it's more difficult at least for some people week after week to be in the same somewhat chilly location interceding than it is to have the uh, perhaps the variety I face in praying with so many different uh, people. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 9 is the New Year's message the Lord gave me that I shared uh, this past Sunday evening in a, a tremendous sending church up near Birmingham, back here in England. And I just thought I'd share a few uh, thoughts from this before I share prayer burdens. 
Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 9. Know ye not that they who run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate or self-controlled in all things. Uh, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, as not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Is this the first uh, night of prayer for the, uh, for the new year? Did you have one last Tuesday? You did. Well, that's great. And uh, was last on Tuesday New Year's Eve? Well, that's even better yet. But uh, if, it, if it went past midnight, then you prayed into the new year. Otherwise, this is your first prayer meeting in the new year. I don't think it's too late in the year to set goals, and I hope you will be setting realistic goals for 1986. And I often think of this exhortation, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. The person, the team, the uh, fellowship that doesn't have goals is, is easily the fellowship or individual that is beating the air. And God wants to give us personal goals. Some people type up goal sheet. I remember one of the leaders from India typed up his goal sheet when he was headed back for a year home in Canada. So I wrote him just recently. I said, um, could I have a summary of how you did on the goals? I think I sent him a photocopy. And I got a very interesting reply back. Most of us idealistic zealots fall short of the goals that we set, but better to have goals and fall short than have no goals and drift or beat the air. Sometimes, occasionally, I meet people who are on and beating the air, and the main thing they seem to be thinking about is when they're going to leave. And God has often challenged me, live where I am now. I also can get caught up thinking about the next big challenge coming up. But again and again, the Lord has rebuked me and brought me back to the day in which I was and say, live for today. It may not be any big events today, but uh, each day is, is important. I was jogging along the beaches in the Netherlands a couple days ago at this tremendous youth conference of a movement I'd like you to pray for called Young and Free. They certainly have a good name good name, almost a better name than OM, <coughs> Young and Free. And I had uh, brought with me from Australia, I'm pushing Australia these days, as you can see <laughs> by my koala bear. Uh, it's proven to be an embarrassment, actually, in some of the meetings, especially in Berlin, when they had this giant television screen behind me, and I think unconverted people on the cameras. And when I was trying to drive home this very strategic point, People started laughing. I wondered, what is going on? I'm obviously not communicating. <laughs> Apparently, the man with the camera had blown this up, <laughs> giant size, on the screen while I was trying to pour out my heart. So I have taken it off uh, in the presence of uh, video cameras, which we also had over there in the Netherlands. But I brought this message with me from an outstanding Methodist minister in Sydney who's obviously a sportsman, and he was giving this message just before the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane, in Queensland. And he gave these tremendous illustrations from sportsmen. Started with Eric Little. I had just seen Chariots of Fire again, the fourth time on the plane, only wept six times, I think, this time. Decided I'm going to, whatever the cost, purchase at least 100 copies of that video cassette and circulate them around the world. And I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to see the results. I really, I don't want to get into this because it would be a sidetrack, but I feel the greatest area where OM is missing the boat is in the use of the video cassette. We're about 10 years behind. Most groups are 20 years behind. We're only 10 years behind. But uh, when I think of some groups still distributing phonograph records, which is probably good for certain parts of the world, in an age when... Uh, the video cassette is just uh, everywhere. It's just literally everywhere. People are renting mainline movies now for two pounds. And we ought to pray, maybe we can include that in our prayer requests, that as God's people we may do more with video cassettes and that there'll be a day 
when the video cassette will appear on every OM book table just like books. Most young people are not reading books. At least in the Western world, certainly totally different in many third world countries. And I just uh, have very much that burden on my heart and had that confirmed again on this trip. So we shared a bit about Eric Little, things that I had, had known before and the tremendous challenge of him running the race. He used this same passage of scripture. And then he shared about a woman who was a swimmer, a world champion swimmer. And her goal was to get her swimming one more minute less. Now you'd think one minute, you know, that isn't much. But in this particular uh, race, not a very long race, one minute is just like, you know, going over Mount Everest again if you were a mountain climber. And she worked at this such a long period of time and could not break that minute. But she stuck at it and stuck at it and eventually she uh, broke that world record through cutting down her swimming time by one minute. And then he told of a man who was a discus thrower. You know, if you've watched the Olympics, these men sort of whirl around and then heave this heavy disc into the air. And apparently this man had won three gold medals over a period of 16 years, forgive me for not knowing the names, then went into retirement and came out again and started throwing and broke the world record again. But at one of the major events, something unbelievable happened within him. You know, he sort of began to rip apart in his rib cage and started spewing blood and just about died. They put him in a hospital, tied him up, and they couldn't, uh, but they couldn't keep him. They didn't tie him to the bed. They tied up his chest, strapped it up, and he went out. Um, I think it was in the Olympics again, or some very major sporting events, and he decided to throw in excruciating pain I think they take a number of throws. He cut down the number of throws. And somehow in his last throw, as he felt this pain ripping through his body, he said, in God's name, I don't know if he was a Christian or a believer in God, he let this discus throw and he beat the world record. 20 years, this man, who wasn't young any longer, had been training and working on that. Um, you know, we have an enormous problem in OM. We have about a hundred problems, and I'm thinking one right now. That our whole, our whole goal, one of our main goals, is love. And if love isn't kept in balance, it becomes very soft, it becomes very insipid, and it becomes an enemy of excellency. Anybody who trains any of these sportsmen, they have to be vicious. If you saw the man who trained, trained Abraham in, in the Eric Little film, you know, the old, this old Italian who won some award for acting, you know, he was really rough. And all these people who win these contests, almost all of them have trainers. And to properly train someone, believe me, you cannot just have the doctrine of 1 Corinthians 13. You have got to really be rough and hard and, and firm. And that's the only way you'll create excellency. If you took a secular public speaking course, some of you who take meetings, they'd rip you apart. Christians won't tell you anything. You go your whole life a lousy preacher with a few shaking hands with you at the meeting and there's always some results. And you'll never know that you're just a C-League speaker. You'll always wonder why you don't get invited back. But if you took a secular course in public speaking, they'd tear you apart. And you'd learn to communicate if you're going to graduate from the course. And this is, this is the enormous dilemma we find ourselves in OM as we go into 1986. I mean, let's face it, in places, OM is getting very soft. Very soft. We had another young person quit not long ago. He said, this is a joke. It's so easy. I heard this movement was hard. Uh, I don't believe, of course, that paints a, a, a true picture. He'd only been on a summer campaign. I don't know whether he expected he was going to eat just bread and water and sleep on nails or what. <laughs> but he went home disillusioned with this movement. That has gone soft. Now, if we go soft, we will never create excellence. Now, I'm not a fanatic on excellence. I even attack it if it becomes extreme because I know God uses all kinds of people 
And I know God uses ordinary efforts. God can use the world's greatest singer, Amy Grant or Sandy Patty or Sheila, to sing in her local church. And I, uh, I really get upset when messages come across that give the idea that only the best, you know, God can use only the best. And God is merciful. That's the bottom line for all of us. But we must not take that mercy and forgiveness and grace as an advantage for slothfulness, slipshod work, lack of, of discipline, and all the kind of thing that we do see in the sports world. We see it in the world of acting. Whatever the Christian church may say about Hollywood and about acting, many of those people are very disciplined people in their field. They may uh, drink some things that you don't drink and go places that you don't go to, but a lot of them are very disciplined people. The state of the church in terms of memorizing scripture could make the most optimistic depressed if he takes surveys as I do all over the world. God's people just don't memorize scripture. In Holland, when I took a survey recently, just a couple days ago, 90% of the young people in the meeting had never read the Bible through even once. That also is just lack of discipline, perhaps also lack of motivation. Any training program, and we realize that OM is many things, and that's been emphasized a lot lately, but it is, among other things, a training program. You know, you will only get out of it what you put into it. There is no way we can force people into spirituality on OM. We have tried for a long time. In fact, some of the people who we thought were going the furthest fell on their faces the quickest when they left. Spirituality is a very personal thing. There are people growing in grace as much as any of our, us who don't know anything about Operation Mobilization or YWAM or any of the other great movements that God has raised up. They just have a personal, deep walk with God in the midst of their own tough, vicious, often secular environment. I don't think we should be intimidated by our environment. Each environment have, has pluses and negatives. OM has a lot of pluses. It also has a lot of negatives. You will all change environment as life goes on, and you'll just get different pluses and different negatives. Do not think all these people in the communist countries are all spiritual people. That is a great miscommunication. They are just like many of us. And among them, there are some very spiritual people. They're the ones we usually incorporate into our message illustrations. I just read something by quite a famous British writer about the people of Poland. It was an absolute laugh. He compared the people of Poland with the people of America and made the people of America look like absolute sawdust, lazy bone, materialist Christians, and the people of Poland, the most dynamic, sold out, committed, anti-non-materialist saints that have ever lived. I just had considerable feedback from Poland, and the state of the church in Poland is extremely mixed with a very high degree of materialism uh, running rampant throughout the nation. We're all more similar than we like to admit. And in the communist countries, I remember the last time I was in the Soviet Union, the first girl, not many people talked to me because they didn't know English, but this one girl took me aside in the kitchen, started to pour out her heart, the same struggles that the average woman has on Operation <laughs> Mobilization back in the Western world. It was really quite interesting. But I think as we go into this new year, it would be so tremendous if we could sit, sit down and, and write out some goals for 1986 and to determine by God's grace to improve in various areas that we have already talked about and discussed endless times. I don't want to take the time, and I know the Holy Spirit can point out specific areas in each one of our, our lives. To me, all this, of course, indicates that the whole Christian life is, is so challenging because no matter how far you are along, there's just so much ground to take. And in my own life, I just, of course, uh, I get over-esteemed in many parts of the world. I mean, some of the introductions I get in some of these countries where they don't know me, it's just quite a laugh. But... Um, I just see so much ground yet to be taken in, in my own life in various areas 
And I want to, by God's grace, make 86, 1986 a, a, a fighting year for God. Sheila Walsh, a tremendous fighter for the Lord, has written a, a book which Hodder is publishing and I hope we'll distribute. I don't know if it's out yet. It's coming out this year. You saw it in the Hodder catalog. There's a lot of great books coming out in 1986. Um, she just shared, you know, and she was a little shy Scottish girl that was afraid of relationships with anybody and how God just took her and made her an international fighter in presenting the gospel to the rock and roll generation that uh, is still out there going bananas. It's just unbelievable the interest in rock and roll right around the entire world. Somebody like Bruce Springsteen has a, a meeting, can be the biggest stadium in the world, everything will be sold out 21 days before the guy even arrives. People are paying $200 a ticket by the time the night arrives. People just go in there for hours. Um, the commitment even of people in the music world uh, sometimes is quite a challenge to me. So I guess I'm still where I was many years ago, wanting to get a greater grip on my own body, my tongue, my eyes. You know, I had another one of those interesting phone calls from a pornoholic. I seem to be setting up almost a pornoholic anonymous agency around the world. They phoned me from overseas can't imagine how thankful people are to talk to somebody who understands the problem. This fellow called me from the continent and he had just had a defeat. He'd been going for months. His fellow is absolutely hooked on pornography. He's a Christian. He loves Jesus. He's studying theology. He'll probably be a minister. And he, his wife knows his problem and, and one of the ways he overcomes his problem is by not, you know, uh, letting his wife give him any money because then he can't buy anything. But he persuaded his wife, a moment of weakness, to give him some money to buy toys for the children and went out, actually this morning went out and blew his mind on some pornography. He called up, again, discouraged, broken, asked me to pray with him on the phone and um, we shared together and then he, uh, he called back and he said he read in a magazine that actually in New York City they have a Sexaholics Anonymous. Uh, they didn't have any address so we can't join. But it's, it's, it's amazing how many people are enslaved by their body. Some habit has just got a grip on their life. It may be something else. It may be jealousy. Jealousy with God is just as evil as lust. It may be bitterness. I would say that's far more evil and does far more harm than, than lust. That's why we have so much killing around the world. So I have this goal, and I hope you have the same goal, that in 1986 I may bring my body into subjection, it says in some of your translations. Keep it under. Bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know, one of the encouraging things as I've looked back over the years of OM is that there don't seem to be many XON people who've been with us, you know, say a year or two, who are castaways uh, today. I have castaway research, another you know, one of my subsidiaries, do anything to find out any XOMer, especially your program, who is, you know, away from the Lord. There are people, of course. But, you know, wherever you go in the world, you find quite a number of ON people, I saw it in Australia and New Zealand, you know, going on for God. And it seems somehow, despite all of our weaknesses, many have learned something quite significant during their time in OM about buffeting that old body. It takes quite a bit of buffeting these days, doesn't it, to get out of bed in the morning and, and just get into orbit. It's slushy and cold and snow and uh, most of the cars that we have don't just leap into action. Uh, <laughs> this thing that we drive around here is like, you know, a turtle who's lost its head. But, um, and then you're out scraping off the windshield and you're interesting, right? This time of the year. But I believe it's all a challenge. If we could see each problem, each problem as, as a challenge. This man shared on this tape about the handicapped Olympics. 
and all these people running in these handicapped Olympics have serious handicaps and they have hurdles for people with only one leg. I don't know if you've ever run hurdles. That is not easy with two legs. <laughs> and here they were running down the field with their one leg heaving themselves over these hurdles. And this one man was running, winning the race. He bumped his knee on the hurdle and his leg fell off. <laughs> and he grabbed his leg, picked it up, and kept running and finished the race. <laughs> you know, it's so easy for us, isn't it? I don't know about you, but it's so easy for us to get into our self pity syndrome. People don't love us enough, they don't appreciate us enough, or I'm not, you know, why didn't God make me more gifted? Why am I a scatterbrain? Why do I lose my wallet once a week? Uh, whatever other great, you know, disadvantage you seem to be facing in life. And I, I've, I would really like to get to see one of these handicap races. I did see a film once about uh, X. I don't know if they're focusing in on my koala bear. I did see a film once about all these Vietnam veterans. That has been so much on my heart in 1985. All these Vietnam people. So easily I could have been born just a little bit later, gone out to Vietnam, so easy. Do you ever picture yourself in the shoes of other people? Come back without legs, without eyes, napalm burned all over you. And I saw this film, I think I saw it when I was in Pakistan, of uh, people coming back from Vietnam at the time when nobody wanted to talk to these soldiers. And this was all taken in a hospital. Jonathan McCrosty had just had his accident. This was all taken in a hospital and they were all amputees. And they had one of these uh, handicap races. What a great challenge it is, isn't it, to Think of the Apostle Paul also with all of his disadvantages. Most of the churches misunderstood him. He was a man apparently that wasn't so pleasant to look at. He had these terrible three, these, these, this problem that he prayed would disappear, disappear three times and it didn't go. God just said, I'm going to give you grace, press on. You know what the present day prosperity extremist movement teaches about Paul? and all of his problems and his illnesses and his lack of clothing and his, you know, you've read about Paul. They say, you know, if he'd only had uh, faith. That's what they're teaching about the Apostle Paul. If he had faith, he wouldn't have any of these problems. I tell you, if that doesn't make you barf, I don't know what it does. And I hope you don't know that term. But uh, really, it really does make me very, very upset. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, with all of his disadvantages and weaknesses, he says, I therefore so run, I therefore so fight, not as one that beateth the air. <clears throat> I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. There's no shortcuts to this. Cannot be done in a one-year OM program. This is a lifetime marathon. So don't get discouraged if you're falling along the race. Don't get discouraged if you're trying to uh, increase your prayer life a little bit, like that woman was trying to decrease her swimming time, if you don't seem to be making pro progress. And I thought of this in terms of our financial uh, problems. The Finance Committee's meeting in Belgium, I've had them on the phone. We're, we're, you know, we're in a, an awesome situation in one sense. But you know, as we look back over 1985, the amount of money that's overdue as we go into this year, which we feel very burdened about, and we're not happy about moving into the year with overdue bills, uh, probably a quarter of a million dollars. But as we go into this with this, this, this huge amount of bills that we're trying to pay and all the agony that brings, uh, we realize that money is only a tiny percentage, a small percentage, a few percent, of all the money that God has brought in in 1985. And so though we have this burden and we're going to be praying about that in this meeting, the priority really needs to be, even when it comes to money, the giving of thanks. The Word of God says, with food and shelter, be thou content. We've had no problem getting the money for food and shelter. There may have been occasions when, through the organizational problems and cash flow and other things, you know, we didn't have it right in the hand. But the reason OM has financial problems is we are trying to evangelize the world 
That's why I don't believe it's just a simple claiming of the promise for God to supply our needs. What we are trying to do is much bigger than that, much more complex than that. We're trying to evangelize the world. We, we produced another 10, 15, 20. No one seems to know anymore. Millions of pieces of literature in 1985. We've seen the ships continue in their ministry every single week. We've seen a massive summer campaign. We've seen so much. And 97% of all of the bills for the whole year are paid. Or 95, I don't have the exact amount. So I think even as we think of these overdue bills, it's easy to focus on the problems and the negative and no one's saying that's not a problem. But we have a lot to thank God for. We really do. The growth that he's given, um, the strength, also his miraculous watch over us in the area of accidents in 1985 is quite amazing. I don't have the exact statistics, but we have had very few accidents at all in 1985. The greatest year of air disasters in history even before the last American Air Force uh, charter flight crash. It already was a record year. Always interesting to hear this on the radio each day as I flew around the world. <laughs> but uh, the Lord gave lots of, lots of grace, not without struggle, as I'm sure you can, you can be. Well, we're recording this for teams around the world, and we'd like to welcome any OM team that's got the patience to listen to this recording. Uh, we're going to stop now and spend a little time in Thanksgiving, and then we're going to go on a little world tour, and I'm just going to share some prayer requests on each, pa each place I've touched since I was last with you here in Brownlee, and that will, uh, I think that'll keep us busy for uh, quite a while. So let's just stop and pause, and uh, let's uh, pray together on the basis of 1 Corinthians 9, the new year facing us and thanksgiving let me just share a couple of burdens and we're going to go right back to prayer for this area known as the Arab Gulf this was our first stop off as I think most of you know Bob Rose and I traveling together about 40 days ago flew directly to Dubai and God had uh, really uh, opened the way because Friday is the one key day for meetings in Dubai. That's their sort of Sunday when they have the day off because it's a Muslim country. And they, uh, my main contacts there are Indians and it's always uh, just uh, such an emotional and, and great challenge to meet XOMers and to meet Indians, uh, to have time in their homes and to minister in their churches. But a group of brethren assemblies, a number of assemblies, they were the first group really to have churches in Dubai among the Indians, uh, had a, arranged a united meeting. And you know, even as soon as I got there, they presented me with a love offering of over $1,000, which was, you know, we were sort of, I wasn't really believing, but I was praying somehow my ticket could be paid for just in the first day in Dubai. Um, we carry interesting things on our trips. To the Gulf, we carry mainly music tapes. Uh, they sell at a very interesting price. Nothing uh, illegal. But we sold 700 pounds sterling in music tapes in that one day. And we're able to send most of that money back in a bank draft here to Bromley. But it, it, it indicates a potential in the Gulf that I'd like you to pray about, and that is to see financial support for the work in India. Uh, these places are not easy to get visas, and airfares are also expensive. Mine wasn't because I just it was a stopover on this cheap around-the-world discount ticket. It would cost almost as much just to fly to the Gulf and back than it would to go halfway around the world on a, on a discount ticket. And I'd like you to pray for the Indian believers in the Gulf. Now, many of them are being sent home. The great day of big money for large numbers of people in the Gulf is over. Uh, many of them are going home. Others are desperately trying to immigrate to America. But there are now enough Indians overseas, if they became really committed to world missions, to be the largest single help for financing the work of God. I'm speaking in general terms in India today. Let's give thanks. We squeezed, Bob took uh, 
took a meeting and I took about three or four meetings on that day. I can't go into details, but we thank the Lord for the response, people who committed their lives. And a number of people came from a place called El Ain. That's down here. Doesn't show on this map. But there's a hospital there reaching the Arab population. And the pastor came and sort of was hoping I'd go back with him the next day. I had to tell him early in the morning we were flying to Singapore. He seemed a bit disappointed. But pray for that Arab pastor without mentioning his name of the church in El Ain, uh, which is a work, you know, among the Arabs. There are very, very few national Dubai or United Arab Emirate people uh, who are followers of Jesus Christ. It's just, it's incredible, really. These believers we're talking about are Indians or Americans, British, a lot of extra expatriates, especially in Dubai. Pray for them. Very hard to have contact with the local people. There's a wall bigger than what I saw in Berlin. Let's pray for the breaking down of this wall. Somehow, something could happen there that the Arab people would ask some of these other people, look, what's... You know, what's this all about? And for the few Arab believers that are there, I met some of them because it's an overwhelming task to be such a minority uh, in, in such a totally Muslim-dominated uh, uh, area. So let's pray right now for uh, Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, and if you feel that's too limited, you know, branch out into any of those Gulf countries. Uh, Kuwait is a similar situation. Oman, similar situation. Qatar, Bahrain, I've heard of some exciting things happening there. Few, here and there, professing Christ. And it is a neglected area of the world. So let's cry out to God. There are a number of exoemers in these areas. Some of them have jobs. Some are tent makers, usually in disguise. But uh, if you know some of them, maybe you could pray not by name, but pray by country for people you know down there, public meetings. It's not good to pray for high security areas for people by name. Uh, in your flat, you know, you know everybody, you might want to do that. And we might just pray for the, the real problem of security uh, in these countries. There's, there's certain kinds of freedom, like these Indians, they have freedom to worship. But I tell you, when it starts moving over uh, among the Arabs, it gets, uh, it gets very, very tense. Let's cry out to God. One other prayer request for that area is that's the country where our good friend Irving Sylvia, uh, we can mention him, I think, by name, uh, is translating the Baluch New Testament. He is uh, in that country. I didn't see him on this trip. Working away, trying to get that New Testament into uh, Baluch language because there are a lot of Baluch people in the United Arab Emirates who is using to test the translation, etc. Amen. Let's just focus now on praying on Singapore. Just some specific prayer requests for Singapore. It is not getting easier to get recruits out of this country, though it's got enormous potential. Upon arrival in Singapore, the stock market there crashed. So desperate they closed it. Malaysia followed, and the government said the great heyday for Singapore economically is over. This is already affecting the church. They have all kinds of building programs and projects. Uh, they're going to battle to meet their own local needs, much less start sending out missionaries or supporting missionaries. Uh, if you could pray in retrospect, especially for the pastors' meetings we had uh, in Singapore, we'll pray for Malaysia separately. They are separate nations, I'm sure most of you realize. Pray especially that we may have greater rapport and breakthroughs with the real sort of Chinese pastors whose churches are in one of the Chinese dialects. We don't have a Chinese prayer letter, so many, some of those people don't get any information. Our, la our letter there is in English. There's considerable tension at times between the English congregations, they often meet in the same church, and the more Chinese congregations. And one of the sisters who's been on OM, went back to Singapore early, was just sharing with me, because she's of the very Chinese kind of church, you know, that OM is, uh, tends to be mainly people, of course, of the English side, even though 
uh, we meet them, they, they're all Chinese. They're actually uh, quite large differences in their thinking. So we'd like to see a greater breakthrough among these churches where they do largely work in, uh, in Chinese languages. We had a, a prayer breakfast with some of those men. It was quite encouraging. And we had pastors meetings for a wider range of pastors in the English medium. One of the reasons it's harder to get recruits is a positive reason that there are many, many groups now taking Singaporeans out. YWAM has grown quite large there, but there are other indigenous groups plus the denominations starting their own little <clears throat> OM type movements. And so we thank the Lord for that. But let's pray for the right people uh, for this year coming out of Singapore. We pray for Chung Ho, his wife gave birth to a baby girl when we were there. Uh, he hadn't named her at that time. Has anybody heard uh, any names coming out for this little piece of uh, Chinese dynamite? Let's pray for him. It was good to meet so many ex-members. We must have had 60 in the Singapore ex-members meeting uh, somewhere around that time. Let's pray that they will see uh, the need to support the work. We were able to share very openly about the little changes in the OM's approach, and it was greatly appreciated in that part of the world. Even James Hudson Taylor III, President Director of OMF, was in the meetings. In fact, I had lunch with him, and that was very encouraging as they wrestle with uh, similar things in their movement. In fact, he wanted to speak to me about what I thought and what was my advice for OMF beginning in Pakistan. I had already announced publicly that they are 40 years late. Uh, because I've always had this theory that when the OMF came out of China, they should have not only included in their target fields Asia, but they should have included uh, the subcontinent. This is one of my little theories I've spouted out in different places around the year, around the world, but not ever before in front of the director of OMF. But he was quite uh, challenged by that, and long before he ever heard that, they had been praying about doing something in Pakistan. They need God's man to pray for OMF. An OMF man who, you know, has the gift, but will give himself to Pakistan. Until they have God's man, they will not do much other than research. So let's pray for Singapore, the office situation there, they need some more staff. I met Rodney in Melbourne. He is definitely committed to go back to Singapore as the country leader. Chung Hoor will work with him starting in May. Alan Adams may be making a uh, somewhat important trip out to that part of the world in the next month or two as he oversees the area leadership for that uh, Southeast Asia and the Far East. Let's pray for Alan. And one of the most important prayer requests, mark this down, is for an associate area leader for that part of the world who can be Alan's arms and legs, as he's on the doulas, to travel around. Exciting things are happening in that part of the world. I just had a letter from Korea. They want to support 10 OM Indian nationals from Korea. God has set us free so that we can talk to third world countries not just about people because the bigger factor in third world countries is not people really they got people it's finance where is the money going to come from from these countries and in mexico i talked to mexican pastors and in singapore and malaysia i talked and i've talked a little bit to koreans and you know it's it's an enormous help for these people to understand what om actually practices this has been a well-kept secret for a couple of decades, and people are quite encouraged to find out what we actually do and believe, and they want to get involved. So let's pray for Singapore right here, in case you don't know. It's a, like a huge city. Pray for the churches, pray for the exilemers, and these requests that I shared in our groups of five or six. Okay? All right. Amen. We had about three or four days, actually, in Singapore including a day after we visited Malaysia. Malaysia, just north of Singapore, you may not realize, is a country that is dominated also by Islam. It's actually against the law to try to witness to a Malay Muslim. And almost all the Christians are from the Chinese community or Indian community. 
Uh, that's most of the people who come uh, on OM. We went to a uh, town north of Kuala Lumpur called Ipo and had a very encouraging time, a smaller place. And often, of course, smaller places, people are more appreciative of your visits since these big cities. They do get an interesting number of people coming through. But if we could especially pray for the pastors and Christian leaders who came to, uh, to the meetings there. Peter Maiden came uh, just after I departed. He came and took part in the Christian camp in Malaysia. Uh, I haven't had any official report from that camp, but that is one of the key events of the whole OM year in that part of the world. We call it a camp because we have to watch out for our terminology, just like in Malaysia we don't have Operation Mobilization. We have a Mobilization Fellowship as a registered organization. We certainly seem to need a strengthening of our board of directors in both of these countries, or trustees, or whatever you want to call them. Maybe you could uh, pray uh, for that. We went back then to uh, KL. I had the joy uh, of, of meeting uh, Kuham's uh, pastor, huge Assembly of God Church, Mr. Gunnar Rutnam. If you could pray for him, this is a tremendous ministry. The Assembly of God is probably the fastest growing ministry in Malaysia. I was staying with another Assembly of God pastor who's had a man named uh, Henry. He's had about 15 people on OM. And it was just so encouraging to um, fellowship with him and see the, the real burden for evangelism. And new churches are uh, coming into being there in in Malaysia. Peter Maiden was commenting on when you minister to people in Malaysia, and it's true in Singapore, there's a tremendous response, tremendous enthusiasm, more than you would find in the average uh, English audience. That's what Peter, the way Peter put it, better for him to say that than me. But at the same time, it isn't any easier for these young people to convert that enthusiasm into long-term action. There are many obstacles. There's more peer pressure and parent pressure in that part of the world because of the way society is, is structured. And we cannot continue an in-depth work there with just breakthroughs among youth. We have to see breakthroughs among pastors, among adults, among businessmen. I had a few meetings with laymen and businessmen in both Singapore and Malaysia, we could pray for results. You know, you're reminded of STL uh, wherever you go, because there your books are, always just, uh, just seemingly ahead of you. Sometimes they do tend to get stockpiled. I've never seen such a stockpile of magazine books in my life <clears throat> in any small headquarters like I saw in Malaysia. Apparently some of them were left behind by the ship or previous enthusiastic leaders. So we had a special magazine book bonanza at the evening meeting there in uh, Malaysia. Generally speaking, however, because of the cutback and, and the watchful eye on inventories, my experience is that most OM bases do not have proper good literature supply. And so when you come in for meetings and you want to really push outstanding books, you can, uh, you can get a little bit frustrated, to say the least. I was talking to Harley Rollins on the phone about this, and have challenged Harley about a trip around the world to uh, just visit all these OM bases and see how we can help. These people need help. This understanding of how to distribute literature, how to sell literature, how to set up a book table, how to handle these things doesn't just fall out of a tree. And maybe you could make this a matter of prayer that we could increase the on-the-field training side uh, for literature evangelism within OM. Because we really are dropping uh, the ball in some cases. With great intentions and great enthusiasm, usually, at least I'm sure when I arrive. And I trust I had that long before I arrive. I need to believe the best. But the literature stocks in some places are, um, are rather low. And when I think of all the tremendous books we have here, you go to some of these places and you can't find them. Now, for Australia, Bill Lowe had been here to Bromley and had ordered a great stock of books, and they arrived just in time for the meetings in Sydney. He thought he was in uh, Brisbane in North, and he didn't think, you know, that I needed these books in Sydney. 
thought maybe CLC could help out. In my experience, most of the groups when they put up book tables do not have quantity of any title so that you can push it. They have usually a nice little selection, 400 young people there in Sydney. But let's, before we jump the big leap to Australia, pray for Malaysia, touching on those things that I have just, uh, just mentioned. All right, let's pray for Malaysia. I think the most exciting thing on this trip and the most intensive thing comes at the final moment of some of the bigger meetings when, uh, though I often fight it during the meeting, I get the squeeze of uh, the Spirit upon my heart, trust it's the Holy Spirit, that says, you know, go all the way and give an invitation and call people out to act. Uh, if you've never done that kind of preaching, uh, you may not understand, at least for characters like me, the uh, struggle that often is. You, you immediately hear the voice of people who criticize invitations. You immediately know and are reminded of those who respond that it's an emotional thing and nothing happens. Uh, all kinds of little voices come. But uh, the Lord gave grace maybe every fourth or fifth meeting when it just seemed appropriate to call young people to stand. They fill out a little piece of paper, write out their prayer requests, all of which I pray through personally, uh, which are now uh, being followed up on by uh, the ICT uh, people here. But let's praise the Lord and pray when we, uh, when we pray for Australia. Also, just remember in general, uh, quite a few hundreds in the past few weeks who have stood up. For us, it may be just one more person, one more name, one more prayer request, but for some of them, it's the first time in their life they've ever openly made a, a, a recommitment to their life. Often, the results are more catastrophic than their conversion. Conversion generally leaves you geographically where you are. It leaves you in your own family. You might have some struggles. But this kind of commitment, linked with world evangelism in varying degrees, often brings absolute chaos in the home. Because they go back and uh, you know, start talking about discipleship or commitment. The average young person doesn't know how to express these things. Says, I think about joining OM for a year, and I tell you the sparks begin to fly. And many of the young people in Singapore and Malaysia are not from Christian homes. You're going back into some home where they're worshiping idols, and are loyal to the ancient religions of uh, yesteryear and trying to you know, tell them you're going to launch out to reach the Middle East for Christ or something. And parents just about go up and smoke. So that's a, a real challenge for prayer for all of the countries that we visited. We, threw, we flew through the night to Australia. I have had 20 years of invitations to this country, contrary to public concepts. I'm very conservative in, in travel, really considering the size of OM. I don't go unless I'm really sure the Lord is in it and it's going to be worthwhile in terms of the money invested. But um, I soon discovered that Australia is a very, very unique and special country. I always had that feeling. And uh, people are very state conscious in Australia, very state conscious. And it might be good for those of you non-Aussies, which are most of us, to realize that this is Victoria, this is New South Wales, this is Queensland, this is the Northern Territory, Southern Australia. We have a lady South Australia. She came all the way from there to tell us that OM is very weak in South Australia. She wants us to come there. That includes uh, Australia's very key city that I did not go to, Adelaide. When I got to New Zealand, I heard that Adelaide really according to some of my met in New Zealand, is the real best city in Australia for spiritual life. I don't know if that's true. And then Western Australia, I didn't get out there either. We flew into Melbourne. We're met by an XOM or Indian. Australia is a very cosmopolitan society. And interesting XOMers pop up there from all different countries. <laughs> But we actually have a Victoria office under John Mann. Let's pray for him, an elderly retired man who's sort of running things down there with the help of some tremendous prayer groups. One of the best places I have ever been in the entire world for OM prayer groups is Melbourne. By the way, a huge city. It seemed that we were everlastingly driving around uh, to the next meeting. Uh, but let's pray for John Mann and the prayer groups there. Uh, let's, uh, the literature had not arrived there, but he had some literature in his closet. You know, in OM you learn to sniff around. And uh, 
Some of that literature had actually been left by John Yar, who a number of years ago went to heaven. Uh, old copies of Operation World. But we sold almost every item that he had in his closet, quite a few hundreds of dollars worth of literature in the meeting. So that was an encouragement all the way around. Usually we were having three to four meetings every day, plus radio interviews, magazine interviews. Uh, it, it, was, it was wild. Mark Smith is a very, to me, key man for Melbourne, ex-OMR from Friends from Broad, now with Tier Fund Australia. We had an ex-OMR reunion barbecue in his back garden. He's married a young woman who came out of Vietnam as a refugee, and her mother and father were there. Uh, I'm not sure if they know the Lord yet. You could remember them. They certainly didn't know much English. And if I got talking to you about exoimers, the meeting would go too long. And I always have this fear when this tape goes around that uh, some exoimer is going to wonder why I didn't mention him. No one would ever say that. But we do like to get all the prayer we possibly can. But we just don't have time to mention but a few. And my mentioning them is not very systematic. So let's pray, probably for some of you the first time in your life you've prayed for Victoria. Pray for David Pennon. He was an old friend of mine from Pakistan, he used to be with InterVarsity, saved through InterVarsity. Then he was in Lebanon. He is now the Archbishop of Victoria. I never realized how many Anglicans there were in Australia. One out of every three persons in Victoria is an Anglican. Nominal, high church, low church, whatever, they're Anglicans. This man is the Archbishop and he's the first arch, evangelical archbishop in 150 years in that whole area. He acts as a bishop, really, of Melbourne as well as the archbishop covering the whole of uh, Victoria. And I know he would appreciate prayers because, because of the large number of Anglicans, he has a degree of political involvement. In fact, uh, I, I had to sit and wait to see him, even though I was late, because the French ambassador had gotten there ahead of me. But, uh, <laughs> by the way, that's the first in-depth fellowship I've ever had with an archbishop, so I really am beginning to move into interesting uh, realms. But uh, let's pray for David Penman and his wife. They have taken a very strong stand in a number of areas that really have, have shaken people. Uh, for example, I have quite a few um, uh, practicing homosexual ministers in that uh, state and he will now no longer ordain homosexuals so that's leading to uh, some very interesting counseling and I know he would appreciate very much our prayers and he just said look anything I can do to open the way for OM in this state just just let me know so that was uh, quite encouragement so let's pray for Melbourne for OM in the state of uh, Victoria. They even uh, process their own money there. They don't send their money to the national headquarters in Australia. They send it to the state headquarters. And John Mann and his wife processes it. It is part time, and then they send it on to the uh, oh the Australia headquarters up in, in Brisbane. Okay, let's pray just in our groups again for Victoria. Well, let's just uh, pray for Mexico for a while. You've got that little leaflet. If you could take a look at that, that's really aiming at next summer. This is actually the kind of leaflet that people have to write in to get, because in fact it has financial information on the back of it. But uh, there's no Emmer, of course, you're privileged to have all the facts. And I think this is quite well done and would like to use it for prayer. I was uh, in Mexico mainly the entire time in Veracruz, living on the ship Lagos. I think it's so important at times to mention answers to prayer, but you remember all the hassle we were having just being in Mexico. That all just went. Um, they were allowed to sell books and they were allowed to carry on. Uh, you know, there were some regulations, of course. There were a couple of hundred people at the Christmas campaign mainly all Mexicans. One group came from Prairie. They seem to be special privileged. Canadians, I guess Bert Kempis is behind that, but largely they were Mexicans. And in the evening meetings when they opened it to the general public, a lot of people joining locally. It was a bit difficult to figure out all the different things that were happening. But in some of the evening meetings we had up to 1,500 people. Um, when I first spoke to the pastors on the Lagos, I went through interpreter, two meetings, 
Well, by the time I got to that big meeting on shore, I just let loose in Spanish, and somehow the Lord gave grace to preach Spanish all the rest of the time. But I'd like you to pray because a lot of people stood to make a recommitment. We have all these Spanish feedback papers. I don't know if we're going to get Kathy or Jack or somebody to translate those. But I'd appreciate prayer because it does seem that in Mexico, again, the place is so ripe for this message. And with OM's shift, I can tell you the old policy of OM about finance is absolutely bad news beyond any question in a place like Mexico. I actually said that to Dick Griffin 15 years ago. I said, Dick, if we don't change it here, nothing will ever work because they so easily believe all American groups and they think of OM as American, they don't easily understand European things, is loaded with money. And we were able to share with some this change. And immediately they were taking offerings in the meetings. I'm not saying they never do that years ago. They did. And I talked. You see, because before we'd always just talk about personnel. OM talks about personnel and recruits to you know to come out your ears, but that's so hard for them. It costs thousands of pesos to get one, hundred thousand maybe to get somebody out. Now we can talk to them not. We can talk to them about prayer. We're talking to them about partnership, and we're talking about one of the ways of partnership is giving. They can give. They can support an Indian who maybe costs ten rupees a day uh, to support. And the few that we share this with are really interested uh, in this kind of partnership for world missions. So prayer first, spreading the vision, definite giving, and then, as the Lord leads, perhaps sending their own personnel. So let's pray that as Dick uh, and, and his men, Durrell and Dwayne Grassman, praise the Lord for the healing of Dur is it Durrell or Dwayne's child? Yes. Durrell's child. Some of you heard he got electric wire in his mouth, but it wasn't an electric wire. It was caustic soda. It was just bad, but none of it went into the esophagus. So actually, I saw the little child. She was, uh, she was rapidly, uh, you know, improving. But what, a, what an awesome experience. Little child in a laundromat started eating caustic soda. So let's pray for Mexico. Praise the Lord for the great open door the ship had. They put their international night on in one of the really big luxurious theaters of Veracruz. They had to do it twice. So many people came. Then they were able to put it on in the open air. Just endless opportunities. And the day I left the ship, you know, this long queue of people, just like I've so often seen, queued up, uh, waiting to get on the Envy Lagos. They were selling a couple thousand dollars of books, some days only a thousand, some days more. And they, of course, should be arriving in Puerto Rico. Anybody know, isn't it today or tomorrow or the next day? Certainly. Yeah, certainly, probably tomorrow. Let's pray for the program in Puerto Rico. Had a number of good sessions with Dick Griffin. Continue to remember him. Mexico has such terrific church growth, really. But there's a need for teaching. There's a need for the books that we so passionately believe in. They were able to get an enormous amount of books off Lagos for Dick's program in Mexico City. They already have four to five million tracks ready for Mexico 86, most of them free. And I just feel the work in Mexico has taken some real steps forward. David Hicks, of course, was down there very much involved. Uh, maybe for sake of time, we can use this leaflet and... Uh, and pray together. Okay? Let's target in on Mexico for a while. In our small groups, which seem to be... Amen. Yeah, if some of you are getting a little cold, you can get closer to the uh, heaters. Let me just say that the, um, the ship Lagos has been ministering now for, uh, I guess it's 15 years, and it is a... Um, it's something to, that we really have a lot to thank the Lord for. I found the, in general, the staff and crew on the ship. I spent quite a lot of time with individuals, you know, quite encouraged. Um, the ministry going on, very good unity in the, the men who are leading this, the planning group. Spent time with the captain, Jonathan Stewart. Keep praying for him. Logos uh, since Dave Thomas, who, by the way, has been in a terrible motor accident. 
Uh, the car is completely written off. This is several weeks ago now. In, traveling in the States, I met him in L.A. briefly. He's all right. But the man taking his place is an Indian, uh, Alan, Alan, I forgive the pronunciation. And remember him. He's the chief engineer. Um, we heard, we heard very good things about his leadership of the um, engine room. It was a, a very exciting visit. It's only for lack of time. I don't say more uh, about that. Pray for the lineup. Of course, the several ports in Puerto Rico, then Norfolk, Baltimore. I'll be visiting those places, both of them, in about a month's time. Very, very much uh, going forward in preparation, and also French-speaking Canada. George Barathon, John Matthew is up there now. So that's, that's moving in connection with the Lagos. I guess one of the great privileges of this whole trip, as we come toward the end of it, is that I was with my parents on Christmas Day, the first time in 30 years. Hard to believe in a lifetime, seemingly, it goes by. Um, and we went out and visited relatives and had a very interesting Christmas. Also, Daniel was there because he's on a vacation. He's back now uh, in the States visiting relatives. And maybe we could just pray for the, the USA situation. The work there has greatly increased in the last few years, but they are certainly short a couple of very key people in the New Jersey operation. They also fight an accommodation problem similar to us. They're also uh, fighting increased costs problem. Um, Dave, of course, not only has the USA now, Paul Troper's on a sabbatical, will not be going back into the same ministry. Had a good time with Paul and Elsa. But Dave also has quite a lot of responsibility in connection with Mexico and Canada. He will be going out to the subcontinent for the leaders' meetings there. So let's uphold Dave and, and Kathy. They're very active also in the church. The board members, very active board there. We could pray a little bit more for them. There's been a continued increase of giving. Uh, in the states over the last couple of years, not you know, not huge, but steady. And they, I, I found uh, in New Jersey, really have a burden to see funds coming in. I'm sure most offices do. I don't think they saw in December what they were aiming at. They were aiming very high, but certainly we had some encouraging giving in the month of uh, December. So let's just pray right now. Some of you, perhaps, who are from the States could lead us in prayer for OMUSA, and I would appreciate prayer for this next trip I have. My trips don't always work out the best in terms of the calendar. I have to build my trips around key invitations. They're usually the people paying the airfares, and OM has got too much money, as you know, uh, to pay for airfares, so if someone else is willing to do that, uh, it's interesting. I've just had an invitation today to go to Texas, next July to a big Jesus thing, I think partly lined up by YWAM, of several thousand people. Though so I'll, I'll have just come back from there and I'll be in Switzerland. Could, I guess I said I'd be in England. And they telegrammed today, said, look, we'll pay the round trip fare and we want you here. And this trip now to Chicago, Minneapolis, and Denver is built around my speaking at the Anniversary Founders Week. I forget what year, but it's the anniversary year. Founders Week at Moody, many, many thousands of people. Then the bigger meeting really was Mandate 86. This is a missions conference of Mini Urbana for university level students in the whole Midwest. Mission 80, Mandate 86. In fact, I have a telephone link up with, uh, with them this Saturday for the final planning. David Bryant and uh, David Howard and others are involved in this, so I have the main a chunk of, of speaking. And then I've given the meeting to others for the last 15 or 20 years whenever they've invited me. I finally accepted the meeting of Bethany Fellowship's main annual missions conference. That's my first meeting starting 17th of January. There's a very key church that God has just linked us with out in Denver. Uh, and we have, I have their main missions conference. This church has got enough potential, believe me, to uh, do more than I'd like to put down on a cassette tape. But let's pray for that church meeting, Cherry Hills uh, Presbyterian Church, already got a great 
vision. And then a number of other meetings, including a Muslim Emphasis Day that Roger Molstead has lined up with Ed Wheaton College and uh, going to be a whole day with my friends with uh, Jesus People Chicago Resurrection Band and uh, that crowd. Quite a mixed challenge, which is what I usually have. And then a day with a lineup people in Norfolk, a lineup people in Baltimore uh, before coming back. Ken Taylor wrote a letter, absolutely thrilled with our financial policy change. He said, I spent many years at Moody Bible Institute, enough to learn that Moody's method is better than Mueller's. But anyway, <laughs> and he sent the check with it. But <laughs> praise the Lord for Mueller and Moody, and may we in OM take the best and mix the best and still have our own roots. So let's pray for the USA and maybe some Americans here. Uh, Jack Rendell, African reared American. Lead us off in this prayer session for, uh, for the United States. End of this um, session, at least the amount that I'm uh, putting on tape. I'd like us to just pray in follow-up for Explo 85. Past history, the largest media event in the history of the Christian church, according to the press, even the secular press. In fact, that media event covering 95 four centers around the world was so complicated that it made that Aid Africa Rock Festival, which also used satellite, look like a very simple operation. And I know that when we were in uh, Berlin, we were in this beautiful Congress Hall in Berlin. Uh, there were four and a half thousand there. And when it, uh, I was there, I had a brief time of fellowship with Bill Bright and some prayer together. He was just going around the world in four days, speaking at these different places. And that day that I was there, the day before I spoke, he was going to speak from Berlin, and it would go around the entire world. Quite amazing. And then on the screen, we'd have everybody in Mexico City singing, and then we'd be singing, and then we'd see uh, the Philippines singing. And actually, all 94 centers were singing the same song at the same time throughout the entire world. Uh, you know, it's quite a mind-bending thing. I think, however, the key prayer request is for the follow-up. My message, uh, which is only a small part of the whole thing, very much trying to emphasize the process, God's process when you leave here. The cross, <laughs> the Lordship of Christ. I felt a terrific uh, response in both places. I spoke in Birmingham, main evening meeting, and then had the night of prayer, and in Berlin at the final New Year's meeting, which was the last meeting of the Congress, followed by the invitation, which was, uh, I didn't have time to give the invitation myself. It was mainly to fill out a form that they were going to keep with them. So in this case, we only know, only God knows the number of that four and a half thousand who made some kind of uh, commitment. Uh, I had a very unique opportunity to be interviewed in Birmingham, and the next day, that was on satellite through the entire world. You know, if I was only given one or two minutes, and that's all I had on this interview, the one thing I'd like to talk about was prayer. Well, that's, what, that's the question they asked me. They asked me several questions they only transmitted. Uh, let's just pray. Uh, we've heard some interesting feedback from our uh, Indian brothers in Lucknow, also their little friend on the screen, big nose Verwer. But uh, let's pray that somehow what I shared about prayer, uh, somehow God would use that to stir these people. I challenged them in Berlin, all go back and start prayer groups. I really feel any young person that is on fire for Christ or world mission should start or get involved in a prayer group. Uh, let's pray also for the Lord to raise up missionary prayer groups throughout the entire world. The local church is really dropping the ball in terms of missionary prayer. My goal is still the local church. I think they're the key to world evangelism. I pray and work day and night to see prayer brought into a more rightful place in the local church. But I believe at the same time, God wants to raise up missionary prayer groups in homes, in offices, lunchtime, morning time, whenever. And let's pray that Explo, I'm sure there'll be many other results from Explo, but that Explo will result in a worldwide prayer movement for world missions and for uh, those things that we know are on the heart of the Lord Jesus. Um, so let's pray right now for Campus Crusade to organize that. Number of XOM are especially involved in European Campus Crusade. Let's remember Bill Bright as he's back once again in his home office 
in uh, Southern California. He's 63, 64 years of age. What a great example he has been of faith and uh, a world vision, really, is quite, quite phenomenal. Let's pray for the tremendous ministry of, world, of Campus Crusade. They must have about 15,000 on their staff now throughout the world. One of the most phenomenal movements of our century. Uh, let's cry out to God for, for that and for the follow-up on Explo as it went right around, uh, right around the world. Okay? Let's again play as, pray as one as one.